Hi, I am Arpita Roy. I first came to CERN as a PhD student from the Department of Anthropology, University of California at Berkeley. As uh, some of you may know, in anthropology, we are supposed to pack our bags and go and live among an exotic community and learn their language. And whatever observations we make in the course of one or two years, that becomes our data on the basis of which we write a dissertation and we are awarded a degree. Now, generally speaking, anthropologists go to far-flung areas like Papua New Guinea or Amazonia or Sub-Saharan Africa. I chose CERN. I go where men and money are. <laughs> and uh, so I spent quite some time here. I spent two and a half years doing field work uh, from August 2007 to December 2009. I spent uh, from m breakfast to lunch to dinner. All my waking hours were spent with them. Well, some of my sleeping hours were also spent with them, but I won't talk about that. Instead, I'll talk about something far more interesting, and uh, which is when I first came in, I encountered and I found extremely strange. I mean, anthropologists are used to strange, bizarre customs, and it is only after some time that you discover the method in their madness, or you know, if there is one, some logic behind it. And so that is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the s innovative spirit of particle physics in the light of the LHC experimental collision, which uh, started. And so when the Large Hadron Collider started its run of proton-to-proton -proton collisions, one of the goals was to search for the last remaining unobserved uh, particle of the standard model, the Higgs particle. And as you are aware, the standard model is a theoretical explanation of fundamental forces interacting between elementary particles. And it is really celebrated as the crowning achievement of 20th century particle physics. Now the Higgs boson, postulated in 1964 as a way of explanation uh, into how masses come about of uh, elementary particles, is required to complete the standard model. And so the most urgent question in particle physics in the last few years has been, where is the Higgs? Now, when I arrived at CERN in August 2007, I asked some of the physicists if they looked forward to the discovery of the Higgs particle and the consequent validation of the standard model. To my utter surprise, they replied in the negative. In so many different words, they all indicated that finding the Higgs would mean the end of particle physics. In one of my first scheduled interviews, I asked Sun's then uh, head of theoretical physics division, Luis Alvarez Gomez, about the fantastic possibility of a Higgs discovery on the LHC. He replied vehemently, no, 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 we don't want to see the Higgs. The field will be totally dead. We wish to see new physics, not the Higgs. I was struck and baffled by this response because of the contrast between what the media was projecting and what he was saying. And he was not alone. John Ellis, a prominent CERN theoretical physicist, he writes in Nature, theorists are amusing themselves discussing which would be worse, and I'm quoting here, to discover a Higgs boson with exactly the properties predicted in the standard model, or to discover that there is no Higgs boson. The absence of a Higgs boson would be exciting for particle physicists, but it might not be so funny to explain to the politicians who have funded the LHC mainly to discover this particle, end of quote. So while the search for the Higgs particle seemed to scream from every poster, the physics community seemed eager to work out physics beyond the Higgs, or what they called new physics. Now, of course, there are compelling reasons why particle physicists are interested in probing a future of physics beyond the Sandler model. For in spite of the fact that all experimental tests till date have uh, agreed fully and beautifully uh, with standard model predictions, the model has a number of unresolved issues. One, it is not complete. Uh, you know it includes only three of the fundamental forces. It leaves gravity out. It has a large number of arbitrary uh, elements called free parameters. It does not offer any explanation on uh, differing masses. For example, uh, why should the top quark the heaviest known elementary particle be something like 300,000 times heavier than the electron. Um, it does not account for the observed phenomena of neutrino oscillations, etc., etc. So all these open questions 
compel the community's efforts in exploring viable possibilities of new physics beyond the standard model. But it was not just talk of new physics that was rampant when I arrived at CERN. One could observe the material manifestation of the concern with innovations at the level of instrumentation as well. Work was already on underway on the next set of accelerators, like the International Linear Collider or the Compact Linear Collider. Now, since the time scale for building accelerators is so large, the R&D for the rival projects had commenced, and the design and prototyping stages had already, were already completed. Now, when I heard this back in 2007, I was very surprised, because at the time, the LHC had not even started, and yet everyone showed unmistakable signs of enthusiasm in the possibilities of exceeding the standard model. But as I just said, the model works, and works fairly well. So what motivates the physics community to go beyond it? Alvaro Darahula, a CERN theoretical physicist, reflects candidly. We've never found any deviation from these models, so we've been right for 30 years. It's boring. Darahula is not alone in citing boredom with standard model physics. I mean, sometimes I wonder, why am I not so bored? It will propel my own research. And so once I asked a string theorist, why do you work on string theory? Because I don't know any other way of keeping myself entertained, came the prompt reply. Not the response the anthropologist was expecting, but whether uttered in jest or in earnest, one cannot disregard physicists' statements on boredom or ennui as motivating factors that propel scientific research. From an anthropological perspective, the conclusion one can draw is that while standard model physics is important, it is not interesting anymore. An explanation into this puzzling character of physics discloses that an expressive or a, a symbolic aspect is the defining moment of scientific enterprise rather than a purely utilitarian one. Innovations in science do not proceed from any sense of failure or a desire to meet instrumental ends, but ideas are often replaced because they are no longer considered acceptable, fashionable, or up-to-date. So what marks science and technology in our times is not simply an exponentially fast rate of growth, but in some peculiar twist, one where the rate of obsolescence overtakes the rate of depreciation. That is, ideas or products are phased out even before they get worn out. I will explain this with the illustration of pop star Madonna from my generation. She used to refashion new personas of herself, e like from she started with uh, Like a Virgin to Material Girl to Material Mom, and all these uh, refashionings were not born from any sense of failure. She, sim she simply moved from success to more success. She was not in competition with anybody externally in the market. She was in competition with herself. Uh, you're more familiar with this in terms of the IP phones or iPods uh, or whatever, the iPhone, uh, iPhone 4 is working just fine, but I iPhone 5 is released, and we all seem caught up and eager to buy the latest one. I mean, I used to have a hideously old iPhone 3, and I used to always hide it. Uh, I wouldn't feel like using it in public, you know? And so here, something symbolic, something expressive, uh, so an aspect of design is motivating you to go in for the new product, nothing in utility. Okay, and so this is the point that I want to make here, that just as Madonna's uh, re, uh, inventions of herself were not underwritten by any sense of failure, the same underlying logic is found in the physics community's endeavor of creating new paradigms and rendering obsolete existing ones. Particle physics is eager to write a new future, even when the contemporary state of affairs is a fairly satisfactory and successful one. In this quest for novelty, Physics betrays that its goal is not that of finality, but of development and growth per se. While there is no consensus on the prognosis of the future that will emerge, the trend itself is seen as desirable, healthy, and normal. The open and contingent future is a thrilling prospect that all is well. It is not entirely for the sake of a more complete picture that new physics prospects are being contemplated. In fact, the possibility that those may challenge or even undermine the standard model paradigm are admitted to and not shied away with from. It is here that we must pause and inquire into the meaning of science. It raises the question, what is science devoted to? 
Pure physics is an intellectual endeavor. It is aimed at increasing knowledge with increase of knowledge as a value in itself. But the social scientist asks about the genealogy of knowledge. We ask, why is pure knowledge valuable? The Large Hadron Collider presents us with the general problem of the dialectics of purpose and meaning. The LHC has been built at a staggering cost of 6.4 billion US dollars. A steady stream of media voices have often raised the concern that why must billions of dollars be spent to collide two tiny atoms in the hope of producing another tiny particle? In other words, can't we do something more useful with that amount of money? Moreover, if science is an ideal which can never be reached, then why must everything in the world be subordinated to it? Why should one do something which in reality can never come to an end? Now, irrational as it may sound, the quest for novelty, the quest for innovations for its own sake is not illicit, uh, is not crazy. But what defines progress? Science is nothing but open-ended inquiry sustained only by uh, continual self-correction. In this spirit, it is typical that science should exceed its limits and does it so often. Now here the word typical I'm using in a sociological sense to ex uh, extract or to highlight the standard modes of thought in the physics community. The spirit of relentless discovery and innovation is best understood, as Richard Feynman famously put it, doing physics is fun. If the Large Hadron Collider were unable to spout new particles, it would spell the end of accelerator physics. The, un the unreal, the imaginary, plays a role in science by no means negligible. The emphasis on unceasing novelty distinguishes science from, say, uh, religious dogma or philosophical doctrine. Innovations in particle physics rarely solve practical problems in any direct way. When Bob Wilson, the first director of Fermilab at Illinois, was asked by a congressional committee, what will your lab contribute to the defense of the US? He replied, nothing, but it will make it worth defending. While the overall power and prestige of high energy physics definitely derives from past successes in the Manhattan Project or the Cold War, today's physics has no direct military or political benefits to offer. While there are spin-offs of, uh, of particle physics for industry and technology, they provide a secondary argument and the contribution to knowledge must be recognized foremost. The Large Hadron Collider represents an extraordinarily complex and ambitious intellectual adventure. In personal conversations, many times the physicists uh, underscored that they could have easily moved to more uh, lucrative professions like finance or engineering, but that their ambition is of a different sort. And so there is a resonance with the notion of uh, science as a calling rather than a mere profession. And if I were to ask uh, to define physics, not in a formal sense of content or criteria, but in the broader sense of determining its form and goal, I would say that physics moves back and forth between giving expression to a world that exists and the heralding of others that it conceives to be possible. As a pure intellectual endeavor, as a fundamental science, and in its capacity to address key questions relating to the universe, CERN attracts a great deal of press coverage, like today, which the physicists seem to relish. Recognition and reward, particularly the Nobel Prize, is highly desired and sought after, resulting in a ruthlessly competitive milieu at times. The spirit of competition fits uneasily with the demand of collaboration that a modern experimental science makes. The tension between collaboration and competition while demoralizing at the individual level is seen as overall beneficial and stimulating to the field. Like any other community, the physics community exudes a strong sense of importance in the universe's scheme of things. This belief in one's importance is crucial to the narrative and action of what takes place at CERN, and among other reasons, makes it an exemplary site for an anthropological study. I mean, these are very self-conscious people who are quite aware of their uh, place, as I said, in the universe. Right in the beginning, when I started my research at CERN, I was made to understand that there is no greater purpose or end that pure science serves, and as it feels its way towards the heart of things, it also surpasses them in search of new questions and new problems. After all, physics, 
uh, like philosophy or anthropology is to be studied not always for the sake of some answers, but if for the sake of the questions themselves, which open vistas onto unexpected and richer pursuits. So it appears that the most remarkable unit in science is a problem, an issue. In the wake of old problems or questions, new ones must take their place. Money or facilities are no doubt necessary for science to take place, but they constitute its external determination. That, that is why even if a laboratory has a precarious existence in the world, it is secure with an indomitable confidence in what it does. And with less financial or state support, science may then be, may then be better or worse, but not false. What is the secret of this resilience? This is what I invite you to reflect on. And here I'm using the word science and physics interchangeably. The vitality of science is not superficial. It is inwardly prompted. Physics constantly seeks to exceed its own boundaries. In doing so, the symbols and meaning of science become intelligible no less than its contradictions and troubles. So while the Higgs hogs the popular imagination, physicists are terrified that nothing but the Higgs will show up and conclude the standard model paradigm of particle physics. If physics today delivers on all the goals of explanation, then it would be dead. To be alive and in business in the present, it must create futures that can be constantly outclassed. During two and a half years of stay at the accelerator complex, I found over and over again expressions of hope and optimism on the possibilities of shocking discoveries on the LHC exotic decays, F particles, unparticles, alongside privately shared feelings of dread and anxiety. Will nature be perverse and stingy? Will she yield nothing but a standard model Higgs? In acknowledging the relentless spirit of innovation that takes reign over particle physics, we can abstract elements of drama, narrative, and symbolism which structure the conditions of experimentation in science. It is clear that if novel objects come into existence, they are not simply due to the inherent unpredictability of experimental systems, but also owing to the self-conscious desire for novelty. Here it might be worth remembering the myth most apposite to physics, that of Faust, uh, the legendary Faust at the summit of human excellence who is bored and dissatisfied and strikes a bargain with the devil for unlimited knowledge. Faust's spirit of insatiable inquiry finds expression in modern physics' unending quest for novelty. With this window open to endless possibilities, science is made more fantastic than religion without being less abstract or vain. Without deriding in the slightest, what I wish to describe to you is that in the most solemn undertakings of science, drama, myth, symbolism slip in, delighting in their own abundance and innocence. However, the sense of unlimited possibilities, their spontaneity and their sweep, does not lead us to a sense of lurking absurdity because the physical sciences are found to yield sufficient and constant objects, from electrons to quarks. It is this conception, justly called truth, which becomes the intellectual measure of all scientific pursuits. As I hinted before, there is a certain rate at which novelty is introduced in the sciences which implies that even pure possibility is condemned to rhythm and habit. That is why I'm far from the suggestion that the spirit of innovativeness that dominates physics is one of unbridled imagination. The idea of ceaseless innovativeness that belongs to the innermost web of scientific thought and practice can now receive the anthropological interpretation which it so badly needs without making it seem subordinate, profligate, or instrumental. For we know too well that fashion may not carry utilitarian justification, but it is not feeble for that reason. The untenability of fictions should not lead us to deny them, but to study them. As an anthropologist, I observed faithfully the emphasis on constant novelty expressed in posters and graphics decorating the walls here, conveyed in the embellished stories of distinguished minds, and dramatized in the paranoia of stagnation. While history of philosophy may evaluate how a speculative insight is integrated into standard theory, if it meets with empirical vindication or not, or if it finds adequate, inadequate support and falls into disarray, anthropology seeks the correspondence of the real and the possible, the expressive and the instrumental, the mental and the material. 
to bewail the costs of intellectual pursuits or to combat the hype of scientific excellence is not the work of anthropology, which finds in the dramatic rendition of innovative stirrings the character of physics most exceptionally manifested. Thank you. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Just a minute, I've got a microphone for you. <laughs> I'll just press re rewind. Uh, yeah, you focused mostly on uh, physics, which is clearly the most important aspect here. But as you also hinted out, there are a lot of engineers pushing the frontiers of engineering, a lot of spin offs from engineering, such as the World Wide Web, uh, solar panels. As an anthropologist, have you had a chance to look at the different tribes, so the physicists, the engineers, the administrators, very different, and in, in let's say, as a matrix to that, the different nationalities, you have many, many nationalities. What would be the key message on how those can cooperate, how they don't cooperate, and how that can be applied to other organizations? Okay, I'll answer the second part first. On the different nationalities, what was interesting for me was that how when they come into, let's say, the control room, they're not speaking French or Chinese or Russian. They're all speaking the language of physics. And so that was most important, that physics forms the language of articulation. And like every other language, people are socialized into it. This was the importance for anthropology, so that when they see a histogram or a plot and they say this is Higgs to gamma gamma, I, for instance, don't see anything until I was taught how to discern and identify and read the plots. And so I focused on this common language of articulation that what allows them to give up their own identities, their national nationalities or ethnicities in favor of this dominant language to be, so it's the technical language that I was most interested in. The other part of your question is very good on the subcultures of physics, on uh, engineering, on the administration, the staff. The administration I did not cover so much. I was not interested in the organizational hierarchy of uh, this institution. I was interested in engineering definitely because it's a very key interface between physics and instrumentation. And so th those aspects I have covered in the sense of like, it is a pure science uh, research laboratory, but without the input of engineering, I mean, there is nothing. And so the most important advances are actually taking place in accelerator physics on the one hand and in theory and experiment on the other hand. So yes, I have been interested and I have mapped them and uh, I have written about it in the major milestones in the growth of accelerator technology. So there also, but you find the same rationale how it wants to constantly exceed itself and be better at itself. Okay.